I'm Jim Kelly. I've been a resident of Hawaii off and on for 38 years and uh, during the times away have been uh, involved with uh, Asia Pacific and political and economic uh, matters uh, over since uh, the mid-1970s. Uh, most recently I was Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs uh, in the time uh, ending in uh, 2005, a period of just short of four years. I'm very interested in Korea and my friends uh, Bill Sharp and Jay Fidel have asked me to come today uh, to talk a little bit about uh, that uh, uh, constantly vexing topic. Well, welcome, Jim. It's really a pleasure to have you here today. A person with your background and expertise, we're really quite fortunate to have you here today. We know you're a busy person. Talk about a long-range intercontinental ballistic missile being rolled towards a launching pad. Maybe it's there now. And, and, and supposedly this uh, missile can hit Alaska and Hawaii. Um, talk about leadership succession in Korea. Uh, the suicide of a former president in South Korea. Uh, what's happening? What's all this mean? Well, North Korea is a very old problem, Bill. Uh, it's back certainly some 60 years. I think an argument can be made that uh, North Korea is sort of the last real residue of the Cold War, which uh, has been over for 20 years in most of the world. <laughs> uh, but there are some really new things that have happened. Uh, although nuclear weapons uh, is probably not one of them. Uh, the North Koreans have been trying to obtain nuclear weapons since the mid-1960s, as far as we know. They may have started earlier, uh, and they probably had them for 15 years uh, or so. Uh, but there are some new things that are going on. There is an internal leadership transition going on in North Korea. There is a special economic dependence on China that is uh, unique uh, in that uh, this is the first time uh, that uh, China has been the focus of so much of what's needed from outside. And North Korea has always argued that it was completely self-sufficient. But the fact is, it's never been self-sufficient, and it needed things from the Soviet Union for so long. Uh, it needed things from Japan. It got a great deal from its South Korean neighbor, and now Japan and South Korea are simply not providing anything. Uh, the Soviet Union has turned into Russia, and it's not in a giving mood. And so it's all the food and the fuel and the money that North Korea needs, at least the vast majority of it, has got to come from China. And China's unhappy about this, and so this makes it also a new and complicating factor. We also have a government in Seoul in South Korea that is more interested in reciprocity. It doesn't want to just pump money across the border. It'd like to see some results uh, uh, from it. We have a Japan that is frightened by North Korea's missile capabilities and alarmed by them and very much and deeply concerned going through to a vast majority of Japanese individual people over the abductions that took place over many years of Japanese even children uh, off beaches uh, that, that North Korea did and uh, are a part of this. So as a result uh, of all of these factors and many others, we have had uh, North Korea acting up. Uh, it has rejected uh, the hand that was uh, put toward it by the Obama administration, and it's uh, playing a very difficult game with this nuclear test, uh, some missile tests, and the possibility of some others. And so it's a, a change, I think, of attitudes. Uh, there's now more of a deterrence, uh, more of a containment uh, that may be going on uh, of uh, North Korea. There's a great concern for its non-proliferation, uh, for it, uh, concerns uh, mm -hmm. of proliferation of nuclear materials and missiles, uh, in particular to Iran and, and to Syria. 
Uh, so this is a pretty serious uh, matter. Uh, North Korea is acting up for its own reasons. Uh, I don't know that uh, we need to be alarmed, but I think we do need to be concerned. Who really holds the power in North Korea, in your view? I think Kim Jong-il uh, holds the, the power uh, there. Kim Jong-il is the son of the longtime uh, leader, Kim Il-sung, who died in 1994. Uh, uh, but uh, Kim Jong-il uh, spent some 20 years uh, getting ready. Uh, he has clearly, within the last year, had some sort of a serious health setback. Uh, it was significant because he opened the country's legislature uh, just within the last couple months mm -hmm. uh, in a televised appearance uh, that was shown uh, throughout his own country. And he looked awful. Uh, he uh, was visibly aged, uh, much lost in weight, uh, his hair had uh, visibly thinned, uh, he did not look well. And I think uh, that's important. Uh, I think that uh, he was sending a message to the people of his own country and to the factions that mm. may exist there. Uh, that there's a transition and there's not going to be any nonsense going on while it's there. And meanwhile, uh, uh, if uh, other countries want North Korea to think about stop misbehaving, uh, they better pay up. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Nowadays there seem to be so many theories that pop up in the news every day. One theory is, well, his mm -hmm. brother-in-law is moving into a very prominent position mm -hmm. and then, of course, just I suppose it is in the last week, um, stories have surfaced about his youngest son, who's only in his 20s, if, if I recall mm -hmm. correctly, That's right. being put on the fast track to the top. Um, and, then, and then other people say, well, it's really the military that holds the power. And, um, and periodically, I, I haven't heard this recently, but in the past, I've heard stories about generals within the North Korean army uh, trying to organize against Kim and they either were captured and executed or were able to run off to Russia or South Korea. Um, I, I don't know, is there any of that going on these days? I think all of that is going on <laughs> <laughs> on these days. There is a, a, a succession process that is going on and this uh, brother-in-law, uh, Mr. Jong Sung Tech, uh, has been officially named to the National Defense Commission recently. Uh, he has uh, long had an influential role. Uh, he keeps uh, the family uh, efforts uh, together, uh, although he too was on the outs uh, just a very few years ago and a number of his key deputies were executed. Mm. So the stakes uh, in the North Korean bureaucracy are pretty high. Mm. Uh, mm. I read that a official responsible for the recent relationship with South Korea uh, has been executed uh, in, 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 in this process. So uh, this tends to focus the mind of North Korean bureaucrats on getting their talking points correct. <laughs> and uh, that's been my experience uh, that, that that is, uh, is, is what they do. Uh, but uh, I, there are three sons of Kim Jong-il uh, and uh, a transition to one or another of them has been rumored for a long time. The eldest son, who I understand is 38, uh, became widely known in the world when he appeared uh, in Tokyo uh, with a passport from, of all countries, the Dominican Republic and the Caribbean. Uh, I'm not sure he looked like every citizen of Dominican Republic, but uh, at any event, he was on his way to Disneyland, he said, and uh, the Japanese uh, were not patient with that, but they sent him on uh, somewhere else. But it looks like uh, perhaps his partying lifestyle, and I'm not referring to political parties, uh, may have uh, rendered him uh, uh, out of the chase. 
Uh, then there are two sons by a third uh, wife that Kim Jong-il had, who herself uh, died just a few years ago of, of cancer. Mm -hmm. And uh, these two sons, uh, uh, the elder for odd reasons that I don't think uh, outsiders really understand, has been ruled out. And uh, I mean, the best sh uh, information they seem to have about him comes from uh, a Japanese man who was a sushi chef for, for some time. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the freshest of information. But at any event, what we're hearing now is that a 26-year-old, approximately that old man named Kim Jong-un, is being uh, groomed to be the successor to his father. Now, the important thing is that uh, at most we really only have about three years for this uh, process to happen in a much more complicated environment than the 25 years that Kim Jong-il had to be the successor. So uh, there are a lot of stories. The, uh, the closed nature of this lends itself to imagination by observers from a lot of different countries. And so uh, uh, one needs to be a skeptical reader as we see this, but clearly something important is going on. So, okay, if, it, if the third son stays on the fast track, mm -hmm. how might Kim Jong-il seek to placate the other son so they don't, you know, try to um, disturb the political process that's unfolding? Well, from what little I know, I don't think that's necessarily a big problem. Uh, I think uh, if it's decided and uh, uh, other family retainers accept uh, one son over the others, I'm not sure there's very much that, that, that can be done. Uh, since we're ruminating about this topic, I have always been struck that Kim Jong-il himself has a half-brother who is younger who has, for the last 20 years, occupied diplomatic posts I was thinking in uh, uh, Eastern Europe. He, yeah. most recently, I think, ambassador to Poland. And if you look on the web, uh, here is this uh, gentleman uh, going around to Polish uh, festivities. He seems to do anything he wants to around Poland, but he hasn't shown his face back in North Korea in many, many years. It's presumably he's not on the best of terms with his half-brother. But the stunning thing about this man is he has a striking resemblance to Kim Il-sung, the, mm. former, the former leader. Mm. So there's an endless variety of, of options and things in a closed circumstance uh, such as this in which some party official, uh, some group of military officials uh, some people close to, to the head man uh, may be able to achieve power. But uh, as we mentioned earlier, this is a high-risk uh, undertaking. Mm. There, there's periodic um, theories that surface, um, maybe conjectures is a better word, that well, Kim, um, Kim Jong-il really wants to open up to the world, and uh, certain people in the foreign ministry share that point of view, but he's stymied in that effort, mostly by people in the military. I sub I've heard that story, and there may be something to it. Uh, I have no basis uh, to know one way or the other. I think, though, that if Kim Jong-il had really wanted to open up more to the world, I think he's aware of the dilemma that, that, that faces him. Uh, if he opens up to the world, if he joins the international community on a stronger basis, uh, he's got to open his economy. And he's got to let the people of Korea, at least many more of them, have a clear view of what the rest of the world has been going on. And in particular, what's happened to what 50 years ago were their poor relatives to the South, who now have incomes that are, what, 30 times that of people of the North. Uh, this is, if, if China had had another country of over a billion people close by that was doing really well, 
I'm not sure the Chinese leadership could have gone through the reforms that they had had. Uh, this uh, presence of South Korea, uh, the realities of, of North Korea, make it uh, extraordinarily difficult, I think, in the minds of the leaders to do a serious kind of opening up to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So they've chosen these halfway measures that don't seem to work very well uh, amid famine and uh, uh, loss of life to insufficiency of food and all kinds of problems. I, I've read um, various accounts or assessments of the Korean Workers' Party, the only official party in Korea, as, as you know. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, some of these accounts say that after the devastating um, crop failures of the 90s uh, and the famine, the ensuing famine, that the Korean Workers' Party's image was really tarnished and that it lost a lot of its influence. And, and the, the Central Mil uh, National Defense Commission gained influence. The, has, has the Workers' Party regained any of its old uh, esteem? Well, it, it, it's very hard for, for outsiders to know that. Uh, I think the uh, Korean Workers' Party did lose a lot of influence, but I'm not sure that it was for poor, poor, poor performance. I think what happened was that uh, Kim Jong-il's uh, associations during his years uh, of, of obtaining power from his father uh, were close associations with the military less close with the party. And so I think that part of his assumption of leadership was a diminishment of the party authority and a rise. And as we saw in 1998 with the Songun uh, ideology that essentially replaced the old Juche ideology. Juche had the Korean Workers' Party at a central uh, role. Uh, Songun is a military first, army first policy in which the first call on any and all resources goes first of all to the army. So there was that shift. Uh, the party didn't disappear. It still had some useful roles and it may be uh, obtaining more, more power now. Uh, I don't know. Mm. So much talk about sanctions these days, and of course North Korea has a lot of sanctions levied on it already. Um, are sanctions really a way to deal with, with North Korea? Well, it depends on the sanctions. Uh, <coughs> the, there are somewhat fewer sanctions than one would expect. Uh, from the last nuclear test a couple years ago, there was a UN Security Council resolution number 1718 that uh, set in my motion a whole series of sanctions, but these have essentially never been observed. Uh, the real problem is that any sanctions on North Korea begin and end with China. If China is the first and last resort as a supplier, if China is the country that shares this long border with North Korea. If China's interests are primarily in stability in the region, uh, and they, if the leaders of China think that, that uh, if they really put the pressure of serious sanctions on North Korea, that it could result in some 20 million refugees coming across their border. Mm. Uh, that doesn't interest the leaders of China in the slightest and uh, put in the best way, and there are other ways to put it, put in the best way leads to a great deal of caution in, in doing this. So that kind of sanctions uh, are unlikely to work, but that doesn't say, because I happen to think that China is very unhappy with the way these things have developed, there may be other quieter kind of sanctions, limited sanctions, uh, and I know uh, the Banco Delta Asia uh, business was one that did work for a while. And there may be things with and without Chinese participation that will come up from the deliberations or around the deliberations of the UN Security Council that are going on right now in the aftermath of the recent nuclear test. 
It seems like the U.S. Is, um, uh, might get lucky in the Security Council and get um, some sort of agreement or resolution that everybody buys into, yet it seems the U.S. is also moving ahead on its own track of, as you said, the financial sanctions, re-implementing them. Well, that's what we're hearing from uh, today's uh, news reports, but uh, in the end it doesn't matter what kind of uh, resolution the Security Council passes. It's how the resolution is implemented mm. that will spell the difference. Mm. And so uh, there are a series of degrees of support uh, from China in particular that are going to be very important in this case. It, it seems through the uh, six-party talk process that the Russians were never really all that involved. Uh, they played a pretty distant role in the six-party talks, but now in the last couple of weeks, I, I sense some sort of growing Russian enthusiasm. Um, well, Russia has a whole set of problems and has had problems, and the orientation of Russian leadership is much more towards the European part than mm. the Asian part. But I'm not sure that I really agree with you about mm. the, the role in the six-party talks. Mm. Uh, what you suggest was my expectation back in 2003, uh, before the first round of the six-party talks. But I found the Russian participation to be uh, quite energetic, uh, always well-informed, mm. uh, and uh, I think they're uh, perhaps not as significant a player as China in the six-party process, but uh, they have a very useful and important role to play, and we shouldn't uh, lose sight of it. I mean, it is clear that Russia does have at least some influence in North Korea. I'm not sure anybody outside has all that much influence <laughs> in, in North Korea. They have influence, according to whatever last gratuities that they that they gave him. I thought it was significant that uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov uh, of uh, Russia visited uh, North Korea recently and he didn't get an appointment with Kim Jong-il. So uh, uh, that suggests that uh, there may be some bounds to the uh, uh, to the influence uh, that, that they have. Uh, the fact is the Russians have made it perfectly clear that they uh, do not approve of nuclear weapons and the long-range missiles, uh, that they don't support this, uh, and that they would uh, like to see uh, uh, this, this uh, process uh, 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 reversed in the case of North Korea. Where, uh, just as we speak today, where, where are North Korea's arms coming from, though? Uh, what portion come from China? What portion come from Russia? I think that they have had technology transfers over the years, but I think all of, just about all of their arms come from themselves. Mm. Uh, I think there was more leakage from Russia in the aftermath of the end of the Cold War, mm. uh, not necessarily with the support of the Moscow government, but uh, part of those chaotic uh, days of the uh, 90s. Uh, that I think there was some uh, a flow of military technology. But uh, other than a sale of some Russian airplanes of almost 20 years ago, mm. uh, North Korea doesn't have money to buy things, and their principal effort of industry has been to, to work on these uh, themselves, and they have considerable capabilities uh, in that, in that uh, line. The sunshine policy mm -hmm. um, of the two previous um, Korean presidents, um, was it a mistake to stop that? Should, it, uh, should that still be going forward? Well, I don't think that it was a mistake to, to stop that. I think that uh, uh, almost any uh, North Korean or South Korean president was going to uh, raise these issues of reciprocity. After all, uh, sending uh, money uh, in exchange for not much of anything uh, for year after year after year gets, uh, gets tiresome. Mm. Uh, that said, uh, 
uh, President Kim Dae-jung, uh, who was reversing uh, things, uh, I think had very high hopes of improvement, and a certain amount was achieved then. Uh, the late uh, recent President No Mo Hyun uh, was less involved with, uh, with North Korea over that time. Uh, his policies have by no means been completely reversed. Uh, there is no sentiment in, in any of the larger segments of political life in South Korea uh, and hasn't been for a long, long time uh, to get into any kind of a war. Mm. Uh, they are, South Korea has developed so successfully, so effectively over so long, uh, if only uh, with a great deal of use of borrowed money. And every time tensions go up and CNN sends a team into Seoul uh, to observe whatever nastiness may be going on, uh, in effect, uh, the interest rates, the Korean uh, premium on all this borrowed money goes up. And it amounts to a tax increase instantly on 47 million South Koreans. Mm. Uh, South Koreans don't like tax increases of this sort any better than anybody else does. Right. So there's a powerful influence to keep these guys quiet and different ways to try to, 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 try to do that. And so uh, uh, the sunshine policy may be gone in name, but it hasn't all uh, left. But at the moment, North Korea is playing very hard to get in terms of this reciprocity, including this Kaesong uh, industrial zone, mm -hmm. uh, which really had potential for serious economic benefits uh, to North Korea, much more so than South Korea, and appears to be in the process of drying up. Yeah, that's an interesting phenomenon because I think that was to North Korea's advantage. It was a, a kind of an easy way to get hard currency. Mm -hmm. um, and the current uh, South Korean administration has certainly not uh, uh, not shut it down in any respect, but uh, they have seized uh, uh, one or more managers there and are holding them. Uh, they've demanded uh, uh, big increases of pay for all of the workers there who were not getting very much of the pay that was being provided them in the first place. Uh, and as a result, uh, uh, in the end, these were private South Korean businesses that were using that. And they're starting to look uh, to other places afield like Bangladesh or, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, far away uh, places with low labor costs. Is it a mistake for South Korea to join the PSI? They seem to put, want to play a very active role in, in it now. Well, I think that was a political choice that they made, uh, but uh, we'll see where the PSI is going. The PSI is no panacea and hasn't been. Uh, the PSI stands for Proliferation Security Initiative, and it's far from complete. It requires really some significant changes in international law. It is acceptable in international law for a country to uh, uh, seize a vessel that may be carrying illegal drugs, but it is not permissible to seize a vessel that may be carrying uh, military equipment for use against anyone. And so uh, there is some real changes of international law that have to be done as a part of that. Uh, there are so many ways to move material around the world uh, and to move technology around the world that uh, this is an interesting uh, decision that the South Koreans have made, but uh, we'll have to see uh, what it actually entails. Well, the PSI is ongoing now, correct, with the United States, Australia, and Japan? Japan and uh, Singapore. Singapore. and. Uh, uh, there are a large number of countries that have signed up uh, to it. Do they actually, have they actually stopped North Korean ships on the high seas? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is uh, an interesting aspect of it. The only example I know of in which a uh, North Korean military shipment was interdicted 
was by the Indians and it was in an Indian port when a ship came in to uh, move some cargo around and the Indians said, whoa, what kind of cargo is this? And uh, either confiscated it or sent the vessel back on its way. I think they confiscated the cargo. So that's the only real PSI example that I know of. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So it, we hear about it. It's there kind of on paper, but it's not really being implemented. Well, we'll because see. Because of the changes in law that are needed. Uh, no, it's, that's partly true, but I think it's also partly true that North Korea has many ways to send its, uh, uh, its uh, inappropriate exports, but specifically weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. and missiles. Uh, most of them can be flown. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess they would have to cover Chinese airspace during that process, but that may be going on. Uh, there may be uh, not the shifting of, of hardware so much as movement of software or mm. small amounts of fishable material. Mm. That's the kind that really have to concern us, mm. uh, moving uh, uh, fishable materials or uh, that sort of thing. Uh, we're talking about things that would be considerably smaller than this table mm. and the ability of any international system to interdict uh, that kind of a shipment uh, is likely to be limited. It's a process that's going on, but uh, we shouldn't look at it for instant results. Has the U.S. overplayed the China card? Uh, that's commonly said, and I don't, uh, I don't accept it, because the fact is we can't get away from China. I had a discussion with some young people in Washington, D.C. just a very few, few days ago. They said we need to get the five-party talks and assert more U.S. leadership in the process. I said, that sounds good. Uh, and they said, yes, and if uh, uh, China d uh, comes up with ideas that we don't like, uh, we won't uh, uh, acquiesce in, in these things now. Uh, but in that case, you're not going to have a five-party talks. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the fact is China geographically uh, is in a very special position here. Mm -hmm. It has an important role to play, and so persuading China is a big part of this effort. And I don't agree with those that have said that the U.S. has just uh, uh, contracted out its North Korea problem to China. Uh, China and the U.S. and South Korea and Japan in particular all have extremely important interests in here. But none of the four, and that includes the two U.S. allies, have exactly the same perspective mm. on this problem. The U.S. always seems to be so disappointed with China, though. That's, uh, I suppose, uh, the fate of many in America, especially American politicians, mm. uh, to be disappointed in China. Uh, uh, but that really depends on what kind of expectations we set up and just how realistically these expectations are based, whether it be uh, uh, for China to appreciate uh, the UN or renminbi, its currency, uh, to make uh, U.S. exports easier to China and China's exports uh, uh, more costly to the U.S., uh, whether it has to do with standards of, uh, of uh, manufacturers that are going on in China. Uh, the fact is we have an enormously complex uh, economic and political relationship with China. Mm. Uh, I think we're doing uh, rather well on it, but uh, there is inevitably some disappointment, particularly in Washington because the tendency there is for people to have what they want and be bitterly disappointed uh, if any other country doesn't quickly go along with it. Mm -hmm. And that's just not the nature of the world we are now find ourselves. It seems to me China's feelings um, about North Korea also are very complicated. In one hand, some of the Chinese researchers, scholars, officials I talk to, they're very irritated with North Korea. They find it very difficult to deal with. 
Yet on the other hand, they said, well, you know, we were kind of like North Korea all, not all that long ago. We understand, uh, you know, the kind of, you know, situation they're facing. Uh, and so they seem to be very conflicted. Yet it strikes me as kind of interesting as something I read in The Economist fairly recently that uh, I think it's 200,000 Chinese soldiers died in the Korean War helping to shore up North Korea. And yet, you can go around North Korea, according to economists, and there's no kind of commemoration plaque or any kind of public display of thank you to, to China. Um, I, I think that China maybe at times is just as uh, frustrated with North Korea as maybe some other countries are. I've heard uh, many of the arguments you have heard from, from uh, Chinese acquaintances. Uh, China views uh, North Korea, as we said earlier, in a, a very complicated uh, way. Uh, China is, first of all, interested in stability in the region. Uh, it is not interested in North Korea exploding nuclear weapons or firing ballistic missiles. And uh, an interesting element now is uh, what we're seeing today this new uh, ballistic missile launching site is over on the Chinese side. I uh, noticed the, that, the North and, and, Northwestern corner. And I see the North Koreans have been chasing the Chinese fishing boats out of the offshore area there. That mm -hmm. can't be making uh, China even uh, happier over, over what's going on. Uh, it's a very complicated uh, relationship, uh, but uh, China is concerned the aversion of Chinese to chaos is pretty understandable mm -hmm. when you think about it. Uh, anyone who lived through the famines of 1959 to the early 1960s, anybody in China who lived through the Cultural Revolution 1966 to 76 has seen chaos. They don't like it and they are deeply fearful of having such a thing happen again. And so there is this inherent caution in what's going on and not wanting to cause in any way a chaotic situation in North Korea. So it leads to a very difficult process in, uh, in, in what uh, China will do. Uh, there is hopes and expectations that they will do more than they do. My guess is that when China does do more than it, do, than it has, uh, we probably won't hear about it a lot. Mm. Uh, they will do things quietly while uh, publicly portraying themselves as, as continuing to be very cautious and perhaps mm. privately. Uh, uh, there are many, many ways that they can put uh, kind of quiet pressure on North Korea and uh, perhaps they will do that. Hmm. Yeah, I, I understand what you mean. The Chinese act like that. They, they do things in a quiet way. They don't advertise mm -hmm. them. Um, you, you know, on the other hand, um, might it be said that um, China was more enthusiastic in going along with America on North Korea until it seemed to them that the U.S. Was, uh, main goal was perhaps regime change? And when they detected that, they became, um, their, their support became more qualified. Well, that's that period from the earlier part when, when I was an official, and, and I don't really agree with that, with that reading. Uh, the truth is, uh, I think that uh, the Chinese in the period of the late 2002 and 2003 thought that there was a real chance that the U.S. might take military action against North Korea. Mm. Uh, they didn't want that. And they thought that that could lead to the kind of instability that they saw. And that's what led to the three-party talks and then the six-party talks that, that started in 2003. But by the spring of 2003, the U.S. was deeply involved in Iraq militarily. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese assessment soon after 
was that no, it was not very likely that uh, the U.S. was going to seize any military option with North Korea, mainly because the military options are so very unattractive uh, in dealing with North Korea. What are you going to bomb? Where are they hiding this stuff? Uh, the answer is that I don't think anybody knows. Mm. And so mm. it's, uh, uh, and yet uh, there are still thousands of artillery tubes aimed at Seoul, so. South Korea. And so uh, uh, the costs of combat on the Korean Peninsula are very great and something that the North Koreans have taken considerable advantage of uh, in seek of at least their more modest objectives. Mm. It always does seem any military option would mean the obliteration of Seoul. Uh, that's a real possibility. And the only person I can recall ever talking about a military option fairly actively was Secretary Perry. Um, yes, that's well, there have been others at different times. Some people I respect who talked about bombing this part or that part. But the fact is, uh, uh, there was a sense that the U.S. in 1994. Uh, was headed more in that way. My guess is that we were saved from uh, being seen as an emperor without clothes <laughs> by uh, former President Jimmy Carter, uh -huh. who went over and made that uh, deal with uh, Kim Il-sung and set in motion something that even uh, showed some results after Kim Il-sung uh, died uh, shortly after then. Uh, we'll never know how things might have been if Kim Il-sung had lived on longer. Uh, I enjoy the speculation that maybe things could really have been significantly better, that maybe the old man was ready to make a serious change, but it didn't happen that way. I've heard some conjecture lately that um, uh, Bill Clinton might uh, play a role similar to Jimmy, the role that Jimmy Carter played. I think every senior position in uh, former position in uh, uh, Washington past, uh, including George H.W. Bush, mm -hmm. uh, uh, former President Clinton, former Vice President Gore. Mm -hmm. uh, the names are legion of people <laughs> who have been tossed around. Uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, you hear every week. Uh, as some sort of an emissary to, uh, to North Korea. Uh, at some particular time and particular set of circumstances, that might be a useful option to pursue. Right now, it seems to me to be probably not opportune with this internal uh, upheaval that's mm. going on in, in, in North Korea. So I think that's fairly unlikely. but. Uh, uh, someday we'll wake up and some familiar name may well be going over there, mm. and if so, we'll wish him well. Getting back to the Chinese angle, I mean, isn't it the Chinese that are the ones that essentially gave the technology to North Korea to build missiles? Uh, that's not my view. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, don't, I think the Chinese have been very careful about providing military technology to China to North Korea mm -hmm. for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 1980s, I had a lot of discussions about this uh, with people in, in government. Uh, uh, Chinese government or U.S. government? Both. In the U.S. government. US government. Not so much with, with, uh, with the Chinese uh, government. Uh, but uh, at that time, it was Soviet uh, military technology, mm. although even that was pretty limited. But I do recall all kinds of reports uh, that uh, we saw in the early 80s that uh, there were Japanese mobile cranes being ordered by the North Koreans. And they would put in the order to Nissan for a great big prime mover crane, hold the crane. They just wanted the prime mover, uh, all of the machinery and the heavy duty. Uh, so it occurred to some people around that time 
that what is it they want to put on top of these crane movers without a crane? And it happened to be mobile uh, ballistic missiles uh, happened to be what uh, they were going to put on there. Uh, but all the American experts were saying, no, the North Koreans just don't have that capability. They don't have any capability at all. And after I left government in uh, 1989, it's 20 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, we had the so-called War of the Cities going on then between Tehran and Baghdad. Uh, Iran and Iraq were in a warfare. And all of a sudden, an Iran Air plane showed up on the runway at, uh, uh, near Pyongyang. And in the sight of everybody's satellite, out came nine ballistic missiles to be loaded on the Iran Air 747, and they flew them off to Iran, who then mm -hmm. fired them on the Iraqi. Mm -hmm. uh, and then another 747 came over, and nine more of these things went out. And all the American experts were saying they didn't have any of these at this time. So uh, uh, I think this is something they've been working on for a long time and uh, have picked up the technology wherever they could get it. <coughs> and uh, I don't think uh, China uh, or even the Soviet Union, much less Russia, have tried to make uh, uh, North Korea militarily stronger, uh, at least uh, since the days of the 1950s, which mm. was another world. Right. Always the, the story about uh, Pakistani assistance and uh, I can remember reading some stories in various publications about mm -hmm. even when Benazir Bhutto was prime minister, that on her own <laughs> official aircraft flying to, to Pyongyang, there were all kinds of forms of nuclear technology. I don't think that, I've never heard that story before, but uh, A.Q. Khan was on the airplane. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> I, think, I think as early as 1990, and mm -hmm. he certainly visited uh, numerous other times. Mm. And uh, his footsteps are now pretty well defined. Mm. Musharraf, in his book, uh, uh, refers to movements of uh, of complete centrifuges uh, to uh, to North Korea. Uh, the fact is, uh, uh, there has been a great deal of cooperation of uh, of uh, North Korea and Pakistan back in those days. Supposedly, it's all over now. We hope so. Uh, but uh, uh, that was cooperation, I think, in both the nuclear area and in the ballistic missile area. And it's not clear who was helping whom out more. There was a story in U.S. News and World Report not all that long was um, uh, suggesting that, that China had looked the other way on numerous occasions. Um, you know, it, it essentially had helped Pakistan get started with its nuclear effort, and along came Mr. Khan. Um, I, 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 you, you don't buy into that, I don't think. Oh, I probably do mm. buy, in, buy into that, but the time and details, I think, are probably Im, Im, important, mm -hmm. and uh, who in China was right. buying into this, uh, uh, the cooperation of Pakistan and China on military matters uh, is, goes back a long, long way. Right. And uh, uh, how much uh, China uh, was supporting A.Q. Khan, my guess is that they probably weren't supporting A.Q. Khan particularly much, but there may have been some earlier cooperation that he built on. Uh, that's interesting. And he may have moved uh, things around with the knowledge of some Chinese. When you were dealing with the North Koreans, or I should say the Chinese, on the North Korean situation, do the Chinese ever approach you and say something like, um, well, you know, if you could give us a little more help on Taiwan, we could give you a little more help on North Korea? No, they never did that. There was no implied quid pro quo? Or? No, they, they frankly, I think, would have known that it didn't work. Various Chinese academics were talking to American academics about that time, and uh, a month didn't go by that I would read, and perhaps uh, deep in the recesses of the minds of some in Chinese, there was that hope. Mm. But the uh, fact is, 
uh, one of the things that struck me after having been out of government for 12 years when I came back in in 2001 was that the China diplomatic, Chinese diplomatic establishment had been significantly upgraded, uh, that the education, uh, the experience, the sophistication of the Chinese was considerably greater than it had been before. And it was not insubstantial before. Mm. And the fact is, uh, I have a great deal of respect for uh, the vast majority of the Chinese that, with whom I interacted uh, during this uh, period in 2001. And they didn't suggest that. And uh, I think they knew if they had that uh, we would have turned them down flat. <clears throat> That's not how it works. If we sold out Taiwan uh, in a serious way uh, that would allow a military takeover, uh, American credibility would be lost with everybody in Asia, mm. and it would never be recovered. Do you uh, support the uh, sale of F-16s to Taiwan? I don't know whether I do or not. <laughs> I haven't been active in that particular question for, for, for some time. I do think that... Uh, uh, that it's important that China never think that uh, it can easily militarily conquer uh, Taiwan, mm -hmm. but that uh, the cooperation that's going on uh, now uh, suggests that maybe that's been overtaken by, by events. Mm. But whether Taiwan needs new F-16s, uh, for a, a modicum of air defense. There's no question that China's military buildup uh, is considerably greater than, than it's been. Mm -hmm. Whether they need new F-16s, I don't know. Focusing back on Korea here, so much talk has been, um, seems to be current, that, uh, well, if North Korea doesn't tame down, if it keeps up these nuclear explosions, uh, it keeps <laughs> shooting missiles over Japan, um, it's going to force the Japanese to become a more significant military power. Yet the other day at the Pacific Forum, and I remember you were seeing just a couple of seats down from me, Skip Orr seemed to dismiss that possibility. And I agreed with him. Um, I don't think that uh, as long as the U.S. and Japanese alliances are, are intact, and have meaning, uh, there is little sentiment among Japanese people for uh, achieving nuclear weapons or uh, some sort of serious rearmament. Uh, Japan doesn't want to spend the money on it. Uh, it doesn't seem to have the desire uh, to do that uh, politically. There are obviously some individuals in Japan who might see that differently, but I think that as long as the American nuclear umbrella is perceived by most Japanese as meaningful, and as long as uh, North Korea's uh, misbehavior is somewhat limited, uh, uh, which it has been even with nuclear tests, after all, they don't have an unlimited amount of fissionable material, mm. and this uh, uh, blowing a hole in one of their mountains uh, <laughs> is uh, uh, <laughs> better than some of the alternatives right. of how it might be used. So where, where does North Korea really want to go? Do they, 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 they just really want, they want one-on-one -on -one negotiations with the U.S. They really don't care about the other parties. Well, it's very difficult for them to have the other parties, and they have dreamed in the past that somehow the U.S. would support them uh, in the way that they would like to become accustomed. But uh, the fact is no U.S. administration, uh, past or future, is likely to provide that kind of wherewithal. If North Korea wants to change its behavior in serious ways. If it really does want to start opening itself to the rest of the world, I think there would be a lot of U.S. help and support. Mm. So that is really a way of avoiding 
having to deal with the, uh, for the North Koreans to have to deal with the realities. In the end, this is a Korean problem, and it will only be fundamentally resolved by the two Korean sides. Mm. And so dealing directly with America a long way away uh, is really a way of postponing uh, coming to grips with the true issues. Of course, South Korea has been a really very, very long time U.S. ally. Um, when you were Assistant Secretary, were you happy with the um, intelligence sharing from South Korea, um, from South Korea to the U.S.? As far as I knew, it was, uh, I think, generally, uh, generally fine. There was some refocusing going on, I think, in, uh, in, in South Korea. But the truth is that notwithstanding press reports of difficulties, uh, uh, the cooperation that the U.S. had from its Korean ally during the administration of President No Mo Yun was excellent. Uh, we made this uh, arrangement to uh, uh, move our forces further back from the demilitarized right. zone to handle reductions. Uh, South Korean forces went to Iraq acquitted themselves with great credit. Uh, they are uh, uh, doing some helpful things in Afghanistan. Uh, the fact is uh, uh, the cooperation all along has really been very good with, uh, with, with South Korea. And so the rumors of difficulties, uh, I think, are uh, something that, that people like to write about. Mm. Not that everything was in every day uh, in, in complete agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is we need now to have a more equal relationship between the U.S. and Japan and the U.S. and South Korea. Uh, both countries have changed enormously they've grown up. and they've grown up in so many ways in sophistication in their economics and their technology and their role in the world and that needs to be uh, needs to be shown and it's uh, I, I don't see any reason that we can't do that thank you very much for joining us today jim it was really quite a pleasure Thanks, to have Bill. you here and i'm, I'm sure everyone uh, will enjoy your comments thank you thank you